biogeochemist, where biology, geology and chemistry all intersect. I'm fascinated by questions that are in that zone. The main word to inject into the, the, this theory of natural selection is, is really chemistry. And Bob Williams has written this fantastic paper in 1981, the Bakerian Lecture, where he argues that if we think about natural selection and survival of the fittest, we need to consider what the context of the fittest is and that that context may well change. Bob's idea is that actually there's been a handbrake on evolution in terms of the chemicals that are available to life. And so before oxygenic photosynthesis arrived and before the surface of the planet became oxidised, there were certain elements which were locked away and were not available to life, in particular um, elements like copper and zinc. And those elements we, we see from looking at the genomes today may well be a key part to being able to become multicellular, to being able to grow. There seems to be a way that the chemistry is almost informing or feeding back onto these major evolutionary steps so we can actually almost trace the chemical evolution by peering into the genomes. And one idea I had was to try and look in the genome of Rubisco to see if we can see times where changing carbon dioxide has actually affected the working of this enzyme. Rubisco is at the heart of much of this story, so it actually catalyzes part of oxygenic photosynthesis and uses carbon dioxide to fix into organic matter and to make sugars that ultimately we eat. But what's fascinating about Rubisco is that it really seems to have only emerged once. There's one enzyme facing these challenges um, and underpinning all of oxygenic photosynthesis on the planet. And that's the solution that evolution has found. It's a very inefficient enzyme in its lack of ability to discriminate between carbon dioxide and oxygen. So Rubisco has evolved alongside carbonic anhydrase which helps to provide CO2 for Rubisco as its substrate. Carbonic anhydrase actually works as fast as the rate of diffusion. It's the fastest enzyme in the West, about as optimal as you can find in terms of enzyme efficiency. But looking at carbonic anhydrase, it's a totally different enzyme. It seems to be very easy to evolve, unlike Rubisco, in that it's evolved at least five different uh, families with very little genetic similarity across evolution. And so it's a fantastic example of convergent evolution. I think it would be great to try and find out how the constraints of chemistry with the idea of convergent evolution may well play out in Darwin's theory of natural selection. And I certainly know that my old lecturer Simon Conway Morris in Cambridge is a real specialist. Simon, it's nice to see you on this rather frosty Cambridge day. I've come to talk to you about evolutionary convergence. In essence, it simply says that from very different starting points in the evolutionary tree of life, you end up with very much the same solution, the same arrangement, more or less independently. So, for instance, you and I are looking at each other with our eyes. We don't have an octopus here, but if I had an octopus in my hand and I looked at its eye, it would be arranged in an almost identical fashion. But we know that the octopus is a mollusk, we belong to the vertebrates, and the camera eye we both possess has evolved completely independently. So that tells us about evolution at the functional level, but some of the work that I've been involved in is looking more at the molecular level and at the enzymes that are actually catalyzing many biological reactions. There's evolutionary convergence everywhere. It extends from the molecular level, such as the enzymes which accelerate the reactions within the cell, all the way through to organismal plants, bodies, that sort of thing. So convergence happens all the time. But what? Why, oh. is, why is there such a, a limited spectrum to the ways of solving what life can do? Unsolved problem. In essence, it's Darwinian. It's a question of adaptation. These are the best solutions which are honed by the adaptive process. But there may be a little bit more to it than that. Biology is part of the physical universe, including chemistry, of course. And could it be that there are constraints working at that level yes which at least in part determine what's going to happen in the biological outcomes. Yes, I think the chemistry does actually prescribe a certain predictability to the course of evolution and almost an inevitability to where we are today. Where natural selection can occur, it can occur with, within the chemistry that is available at that time. And should there be a major revolution to that chemistry, then that could well lead to a, a novel step of evolution. And life learns to use the these things that are initially toxic to its processes. So the revolutions and the, the chemical catastrophes, you could almost say, actually seem to provide opportunity for advancement and evolution to complexity. Once there were bacteria, 
Now there's New York, okay? Sure, things have changed. The periodic table is populated by life. Of course, you only need a handful of elements to make a protein. If we then look at the way proteins work, especially the enzymes, which allow life to do things like photosynthesize, they're remarkably constrained. Photosynthesis is a fantastic example because you have a myriad of proteins involved in that, but at least in the carbon fixation step, you have this enzyme Rubisco, which I've worked a little bit on. And looking at uh, across the Rubiscos that we see in plants and algae in the ocean, there are very limited variation on that. It's really one single solution. As oxygen has risen and carbon dioxide has declined, that's made it even more challenging for Rubisco. And that brings in this other fascinating enzyme, carbonic anhydrase, where Rubisco is inefficient, something else can pop up that can work cooperatively. Carbonic anhydrase is absolutely astonishing, and yet the evidence suggests it's evolved three, four, maybe even five times independently. It is one of the best examples of evolutionary convergence at the level of molecules. We're here in Cambridge, Simon. We know that Darwin was here. What would he say has happened to his theory with our new knowledge of the geological record of biological organisms and the diversity of life? What a question. I think he would be delighted. Darwin principally viewed the world through the lens of natural selection and adaptation, and that's crucial to the evolutionary synthesis. But it's increasingly clear there's a great deal more involved. I think one thing about Darwin is that quite frequently in his works he'll ask a question and says, I'm puzzled by this, and almost invariably that's turned out to be an area of enormous importance in later investigations. I think probably what would have astonished him in a sense is just how complex biological form is. He didn't know about the genes, of course, but the great thing about Darwin, he was genuinely modest and he was genuinely curious. And as far as I'm concerned, and I'm sure that's true of you as well, if we follow in Darwin's footsteps in that regard, we can't really go too wrong.